How do you design Uber Eats? Okay, that, that's good. So let me think about Uber Eats. So there can be many things. Let me figure out. Okay, so when we talk about Uber Eats, let's start with the requirements. So if we think about Uber Eats, there will be some kind of restaurant there. Uh, then maybe, I mean, maybe adding... So removing, so I'm just thinking through, I'm kind of brainstorming right now of what can go in Uber Eats right now. So there are restaurants over there, there are customers who buy the, like who place an orders, then there are orders that they place, then there are dashers or delivery persons. So like in DoorDash, there are dashers, there are delivery persons here. So in terms of, I'm trying to understand the requirements. So here, when we talk about restaurants, there can be like, uh, maybe we can give uh, a mechanism for them to add, remove, uh, uh, like remove, we will be doing ourselves, but uh, maybe updates, anything over there. Then customers, the profile that restaurants we created, so maybe they can view them, they can search, search, they can do in a variety of ways, I guess. So one of the common ways is like sorting by distance, like which restaurants are near and even the delivery time. Like I think here it matters because we want to make sure that uh, we are getting uh, like if you want, if you are hungry right now, that we are getting food much quicker even if the distance is small uh, or big, so it doesn't matter. Then yeah, these, so let, yeah. let's say for, for our V1 here, I, I like how you're considering like what's valuable to all the different kinds of users. There's delivery right. people, there's a restaurant, there's the actual consumer who's ordering the food. So let's say for our example here or our, our exercise here, um, sure. let's go with adding a restaurant to okay. this, the system. Um, let's go with the consumer being able to view the restaurant. Okay. Let's go with the consumer being able to search for restaurants and being able to search by time and search uh, like time to deliver and searching by the distance. Okay. Okay. Sounds good. So, yeah, I think I'll skip uh, these parts. I mean, they can create the orders also, but I'll skip. Yeah, they can create orders or even dashers can look for notifications. But here I will focus on these parts that you mentioned. So like thinking from uh, thinking that into account. So in terms of like non-functional requirements. Uh, so uh, I, I have a quick question. Uh, how can a restaurant be added to the Uber Eats? Let's assume that the restaurant has personnel and employees and they go through the, some process themselves to add themselves to Uber Eats. Okay, sounds good. So I'm assuming then restaurants will have some kind of menu options um yeah so here uh yeah let's assume that there's some standards that we give all the restaurants saying hey if you want to get added to uber eats you've got to follow these standards you've got to upload these assets like images and json csv sure. menu items and prices so uh customers or like restaurants themselves they have to do all the, all these things on their own okay sounds good so let me think about the non-functional requirements part now that's uh, thinking about it's, it's scalability in general. I, I believe like uh, I'll go to the back of the envelope estimation also, but uh, in general, I'm assuming that uh, we want like Uber Eats is pretty big. It's spread across the world. So I'm assuming we'll want it scalable. It's a scalable solution from consistency perspective. Usually what we do is like when a restaurant is added or anything ch changes, doesn't need to be like immediately reflected right that second. So I would consider it to be eventual consistency. Please correct if uh, I was fine. Yeah. Over there. And then we think about availability. I'm assuming the system like you would like to be searching uh, restaurants and uh, viewing them. You want it to be available. You don't want page to crash. So kind of a very high availability that we'll think about. And uh, in terms of security, yes, uh, I think we can think about like uh, only logged in users, like some kind of IAM, uh, some identity access management system that we will provide then with some login mechanisms and all. And even the standard things, rate limiting, 
uh, the DDoS attacks, preventions, uh, I can assume, maybe I can add to the system. And uh, in terms of, yeah, one more thing I think that's, I think it's important is the latency. Because when you, you are viewing that uh, restaurant page so many times when a customer is viewing, they want it to be pretty fast. So usually I think what I've seen in my history, like it's as fast as like 150 milliseconds um, for viewing uh, such kind of pages and even searching should be pretty fast. Even Google does it uh, less than 400 milliseconds uh, for most of the queries, maybe even faster. So search, I, I'm assuming these should be faster. Adding, I'm assuming that uh, adding can be in general uh, okay because uh, so if we talk about restaurants, like standard things, like if you are adding a menu, menus, like if you talk about uh, menu has images. So if you think about here, so menu, it will have a lot of images, some kind of text or title for each of the item, menu item, then, then there, there is going to be price. So adding images is, uploading images might take some time. So I'm assuming something like uh, a reasonable number, maybe 10 to 15 seconds to upload, or maybe one minute uh, to upload and uh, upload images and all. So we can even optimize it, but let me uh, think about it. So what do you think uh, about these non-functional requirements? Any concerns with that or are we good? No concerns here. Uh, these non-functional requirements sound good to me. Um, let's let's move on to the actual design and maybe we can come back to these if there's any questions I have. Yeah, so I, I think one thing I would like to do is back of the envelope estimation, which is super critical to understand how we come up with the design. So like uh, if we talk, think about uh, maybe restaurants, it's probably kind of 1 million, I would say maybe to start with and probably 100 restaurants added every day. So if you think about it, like 100 multiplied by 365 days, so around 36.5K restaurants. And if, if we think about 20 years, so it's like 0.73 million. So it's going to be around 1.73 million restaurants, even after 20 years. I don't think it's that huge as such. Uh, but if we, I think if we think about customers, right? So customers, there will be a lot of customers ordering from even one restaurant every day. And uh, there might be some customers that are just viewing and not ordering. So I guess probably 100 million is uh, some kind of rough estimate that we I can think about and maybe we are adding, sorry, uh, we are adding maybe 10K customers per day. So which is around uh, 10,000, so 365,0K uh, multiplied by 20. So it's like, it's going to be huge as such. So around 73 million. So 73 million, 173 million, it's, quite a lot. So 173 million. But I think one thing to notice is I think the restaurants are less in number, but still the number of like calls, I think view is going to be pretty high. So if you think about the view, uh, views probably around, uh, probably around maybe 100 million per day. It's, it's, I mean, it's normal. Even the search, I would say, kind of around same. So mm -hmm. search or views. So maybe I can assume these and move on from sure. um, and think about the actual design. So yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This scale, this scale makes sense. And let's. I'm curious to see like what this design looks like to support these estimates. Sure, sure. So so if uh, let me think about so from the data perspective. So we have like 1.73. And like I was here, I was, let me just uh, create a table. So I'll just create. So if we have, let's say a menu, uh, so menu item probably, menu item like I mentioned here. So we have price, we can have currency, oh, sorry. So we have currency. Yeah, I'll just add a box instead. I think, so, yeah, this works. 
So price, currency, then image URLs. So I would say, I think one, maybe multiple image URLs. So these are some of the fields that I would, I'm just creating some kind of database, uh, kind of data modeling I'm doing where uh, it's uh, mainly like maybe menu item ID, we can say item ID and uh, then item title is important, currency, price, image URL. So, and if, we, if I think about restaurant, so probably maybe th these restaurants can be like main, mainly their name, ID, you can say, then their address, location, so maybe zip code, country. Uh, and uh, I think we are talking about uh, even ordering from the restaurant. So we want even the nearest distance uh, from the restaurant to our location. So we would need some geo locations like latitude, longitude. Uh, let me think about it more. Uh, like there are some ways we can optimize it all. So using geo hash. Uh, so let me think about geo hash in a little bit. Whether yeah, maybe uh, high, from a high level uh, explanation, what is geo hash? So in terms of so geo, so if you think about latitude and longitude, right? There, are, if you think about world in the world, I think it's like three to to power sixty four combinations of latitude and language longitude. So it's a lot. I mean, every, and if you think about decimals, like the latitude can be 41.00001 and all. So the geohash is a way to divide uh, our world map, our world map into different grids of a decent size. So that, so that it can be used for like, so, so that we can use it for optimization. Let me let me explain how GeoHash works. Like here, uh, let me just go and uh, get world map, and let me show what it looks like. So, I'll just yeah, let's say I'll just copy this over, copy image, and explain what I'm trying to say. So, mm -hmm. so the way it is like we have this world map, and the way GeoHash works is it divides world into grids so and assigns unicode character sorry assigns binary values so of different sections so like i divided into four sections now what geohash with geohash what we can do is we can just add uh, here so this is zero zero this is zero one this is uh, I, this is one one and this is one zero. So I can continue subdividing this one world. Like I can divide here, then th this will be zero one zero 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 Got one. It. So you just keep making smaller and smaller grids. Yeah, making it smaller and smaller because let's say if we think about um, our home or even a shopping complex, right? A shopping complex time to deliver from one shop to another, like whether we are delivering from the first shop or the 10th in that same line, it's almost going to be very same, like very similar time that it will take. So what GeoHash does is it, it is a way to group locations together for optimization purposes. So like here, um, it we continuously subdivide, subdivide, and ultimately at every one by 30 second, like if we divide into 30, 32 grids here. So after every like here, if we think about it, so this will become, uh, I would just type here, it will become zero one, zero zero, uh, like zero zero and kind of zero. So it divides it into like, such kind of sections and then at every level so geo has level one is the whole earth whole mm -hmm. map whole world geo has level two is one by 30 second one by, th one by 32 which is our base 32 of this this binary values so what this can encode to like if we think about base 32 right 
So base 32 mapping, we can have uh, uh, here, sorry. I'll just add uh, text. Okay, maybe we I'll add a table here. Okay, here. So if we think about zero one zero 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 can be encoded to eight. So with base thirty two, what happens is base thirty two is mainly thirty two, uh, like thirty two characters. Kind of uh, what do you say? Like zero two through nine. There are multiple ways to encode it. So zero through nine, then A to kind of Z, I would say zero to seven or some people encode like this. So you have eight values here and you have 26. In fact, I mean, sometimes it's zero to five. So there are ways, I think GeoHash, how it does it, I don't exactly remember what exact uh, Unicode, what exact value does it map to, but uh, essentially those are mainly 32 uh, variants. Interesting. So it, so it encodes it into like base 32. So level one, it's, you can say eight. And now if we continue subdividing, if you think about San Francisco, it will come out to be like, if, if you think about entire San Francisco, maybe something like this, uh, level, maybe five, level five. I'd, yeah, I'm not sure, but we'll have to check. So there's some optimizations you can use by subdividing like the world into smaller, smaller grids, and you can compare these values to understand proximity, right? That's right. Okay, so, cool. So like, I, I don't want to spend too much time on this. I think uh, I understand I can go deeper here, but uh, let's assume, let's make the assumption that we're using geohashing here. Um, I love that we're able to deep dive here if we wanted to, but let's zoom out and think about like this, this actual system. Um, so. Sure. Let's pick off, uh, pick up, uh, yeah, like here, like where we we said that we'll use geohashing. Yeah, yeah, we might use. Uh, let me think about it uh, exactly. I'll share the pros and cons, but let me first complete the data modeling part. Sure. So, so let me have this customers also. So if we think about a customer, so customer will have the same uh, kind of ID name, then address, zip, country. We can have latitude, longitude, and uh, there can be, I mean, it's for restaurants, we'll have menu also. So menu can have a list of menu items. We can have a list of menu items or a kind of, we can have menu items or uh, we can create another table. If you are using relational database, we can have restaurant ID and menu item ID as mm. separate one. Uh, so let's so we can have so but let me think about uh, relational versus no sequel here first so if we think about like 1.73 million it's really not a big number so and i know the number of calls is pretty high so i think we are better off using kind of relational database for this one with multiple read replicas. So here, I think if we think about database, uh, database, sorry, icon, I think, database. So here, this can be the, what do you call, maybe relational DB with the read replicas. So read replicas means the data, whatever we write over here, it's replicated to the read replicas, the other database machines that can be used for read purposes. So that helps with scaling, but I don't think that will work from the customer perspective because customers can be huge. We have 173 million and for that we will need sharding. Uh, so this one, is restaurant for customers yes we will have to use sharding over there uh, to scale it up and with sharding we can do by customer id as such it should be fine uh, I think from database choice perspective, I think we can use the NoSQL databases like Cassandra or 
uh, other NoSQL systems. So I would say here, uh, here, so customer tables mainly kind of, let's start some NoSQL database we have that supports automatic sharding as well. So now let me think about the user experience part. So if we think from the user perspective, so let's start with user here. So user, so I would create from, from this uh, experience perspective. So if a user, let's say if uh, restaurant admin owners and they have their personals who are going to add restaurants. So we'll have, I think the way I design services is mostly, I create some kind of experience layer first. So that experience layer I create because there, because we might want to expand to other platforms like native iOS, Android, or mweb, mobile web, desktop web. So getting some kind of centralized place to orchestrate uh, different services. I think right now we are focusing on a simple service, but later on orchestration becomes very important between different services. And uh, orchestration and uh, even shared backend, kind of like shared backend UI, some kind of central UI uh, elements that we can share. So I kind of create that and then I'll create some kind of uh, service for restaurant. So mainly one service. So whenever I use, I, I think one thing to note is whenever I, I talk about any services, then I'm assuming that load balancer is on top of it. So because I'm talking about a cluster of machines, multiple machines, and a load balancer will need to uh, decide which machine is having lesser traffic or go round robin way so it can choose uh, the protocol that it wants to follow. So now before adding the restaurant data to the applicas, I think we are assuming that there will be some kind of menu with text and images. So images, I think images sending it over, storing here probably is going to be overkill, I think. So for images, we tend to use, uh, it's good to use S3 or those kind of object storage, where, which can store a lot more data and it's efficient over there. So for that, I'll create an image service, mainly here, which user will just call that image service to upload the images. We can do parallelization over there, like concurrently uploading multiple images. And uh, then it will go through, uh, since images, we want to make sure that we are storing quality images. So it, I, we would like to go it to different, like, I mean, some kind of moderation policy as well. There are multiple models, machine learning models that we can create to moderate such kind of images. So let's say image moderation. Uh, ML API I can create. And that goes through models that have high precision and recall. So some kind of, yeah, Python, we, there are ways to like Python models, ML models that are already trained and maybe with high precision recall. So what they will do is those, those, they will uh, use some classification algorithm to figure out whether that image is really bad or not safe for work or uh, whether that contains some kind of profanity image that we don't want to show to the public. Got so it. And, and here, here, how, how do you define precision and recall? So in terms of precision, so when we think about uh, like bad images, so what precision means is like the total number of images that we detected as bad, how many of them are really bad? So let's say we detected 10 images are bad and out of that nine images are bad, one is not. So it's like 0.9, then uh, like something like that. And recall means out of all the bad images, how many images are 
detected by the system. So like precision is mainly uh, true positive divided by true positive plus uh, false positives. So mainly all the positives that were detected, how many were really bad? And recall is mainly two positives by two positives plus false negatives. Does it answer? How do you figure out? Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah, I'm just asking. Does it answer your question? This does. And uh, for all all the bad images, uh, how would you know like how many were detected? So that one, we will run through the models. Like uh, th these are the like, trained models. So the model training happens, like, it takes a while. You, you have so many samples, you can get data from Kaggle, you can de get data from external sources, or you can even train models using your internal images, like with the, all the images that we have. So we'll have some kind of training data. We'll run, create models, some classification model, train them, and then you run it against some of the test data. Using that test data, we will be able to figure out what the precision and recall values are. How, how is that model performing against the test data? Okay. Um, and what if we're running like our test, our tests against test data, and we find that our current machine learning infrastructure is just too slow? And uh, sure. like, what, what, what changes would you make here? Yeah, yeah, so if we think about like machine, so training definitely takes a while and sometimes people definitely use, I mean, GPUs instead of CPUs because they are more efficient. So for testing, like when we, let's say when we are providing a new image for moderation purposes, we can check whether it's like, maybe we can think about other optimizations here in that moderation API, Maybe, I mean, if the moderation API is slow, we can think about adding, scaling it up, maybe adding more machines, or we, whether it's, I mean, even maybe multiple cores, we can think about, or maybe we can think about GPU. It really depends upon what is the bottleneck, what is slowing it down. But assuming that we are not able to make all those changes, if we are not able to make all those changes, I wouldn't uh, let users suffer due to slowness of this moderation API, one of the options that we have uh, is uh, maybe we can just store this data, like image service can just upload and store it in the database and will maintain some kind of flag. And then when you upload these images, so let me see here. So when we have this S3, right? So here, let, let me, see here so after these uh, i think it's taking some space let me just move this down right so s3 so after uh, all these i i mean ideally i would be just storing it to, into S3, that will be getting a grid. So it will be stored and getting a grid. And that grid I'll pass over to get it stored over in this restaurant table with the image goods. I, I would say goods, I wouldn't store the image URLs. I would say image grids that are IDs for the images. So, but if these image, like machine learning infrastructure is slow, then maybe I'll just store these rather than running them through the machine learning infrastructure. And after they are stored here, then I'll drop an event, some kind of event, let's see. So restaurant service will drop some kind of event into an offline consumer, like maybe some kind of Kafka queue. And that queue, like, Publisher, I mean, it publishers, uh, so it will just publish that event and there will be some kind of consumer, we can save a Kafka consumer that will be listening to the events in this queue and it will be taking over and then running this moderation API. And when the, it runs this moderation API, it gets the, uh, it gets to know whether the moderation is 
the, the classification is saying whether the image is bad or not. It can update a flag in the restaurant table. I would say here, maybe instead of image grids, I can share some kind of image. Uh, yeah, image uh, metadata here. This is menu item, right? So we can even share store some kind of JSON blob here. Um, okay. Shows the metadata as well as image grid, so it can hide it if it wants. So that we can do if uh, the machine, if you're not able to optimize this image moderation, I think it will be needed even for search. Like I can go over the search design as sure. well. Sure, sure. Let's do that real quick. Yeah. So here, <clears throat> I think so. One is viewing part. So if you are talking about viewing the restaurant, so it will go through the view. Uh, here experience layer, then go to the view. I think one thing is important for the view purposes is since the SLA is pretty, uh, like pretty low, I would say 150 milliseconds. Maybe I think we might want to leverage some kind of cache uh, and where we can, in that cache, we can store because the menu is, menu doesn't change that often. So retrieving the menu, uh, retrieving other details, you can store in the cache with maybe LRU or some kind of mechanism. Even we can com compress it um, if the storage is an issue, and then use it in if then use the data from restaurant if it is not found in the cache. But uh, from the search perspective, what we can do is like it will call a search service, let's say, and uh, if we think about the, if we think about just distance based search, like which restaurants are nearby. So I think elastic search is a good approach. Elastic search, it provides different mechanisms, like different geo queries. We can even store like here, what I would do is uh, I would store uh, maybe the all the restaurants uh, coordinates here. So whenever, let's say, whenever something is to be delivered to me, so I have my own point, like I have my own coordinates. I can run a geo query against Elasticsearch and figure out which restaurants are nearby. Like uh, that I can do. Let me go over the query in a little bit. So- And is, is this Elasticsearch based on the geo hash? So Elasticsearch is uh, used to be based on GeoHash. Now what they are using is some kind of uh, block BKD, which is block K dimensional tree. So yeah, let me explain this further. So GeoHash, I think one of the ways that we are talking about is Elasticsearch. Another alternative we could have done is we were storing uh, latitude and longitude here and Maybe, I mean, uh, if we had used, if we had not used Elasticsearch, the way to uh, use would be like select star from restaurant where latitude is less than, is kind of less than some user input. So input latitude plus, yeah, input latitude minus, let's say, it, let's say if we want 20 miles or 20 kilometers. So, and latitude is greater than input, that I would say plus 20 kilometers minus 20. So something like that, and same with longitude. So this would have been pretty slow, even if we index it. The way GeoHash would help here is maybe, some kind of like we have geo hash like uh, we'll have like here I mentioned right San Francisco some kind of eight C eight S so eight C eight S one percentage so here like after that five divisions whatever in that grid whatever uh, restaurants lie we can get those restaurants from here. But here, Elasticsearch 
Now it's used some kind of block K dimensional tree, which is an enhanced version, a multi-dimensional version of binary search tree. So, and that's how it optimizes. Got it. Okay, cool. Um, thanks for, for uh, walking through that and uh, answering my follow-up questions. Let's say we have five minutes left in this mock interview. Sure. Um, how would you wrap things up? And can you give me a quick summary on just like how the user interacts with all the services to get a food order? Yeah, I think I'll just quickly cover this isochrones part. I think one thing I didn't mention is about uh, getting a list of restaurants based on their time, like based on their time of delivery. Mm -hmm. I think for that, isochrones really help. Uh, okay. I think yeah, maybe just like high, high, high level, like talk through it. Like uh, we, we yes. don't need maybe a diagram for this part. Okay. So isochrones is like, uh, I mean, for a given point, like for me, I'm staying here. Anything any restaurants which can be delivering within, let's say, next 30 minutes. So I'll have a, some kind of diagram, a map, a kind of a grid, uh, not a grid, but some kind of curve, it, some kind of polygon that I can create uh, based on the time to deliver from my particular location. So when I have that, um, that thing cast, like cast in maybe DynamoDB or somewhere, so that search service can just get that isochrone, get that polygon and compare with the restaurant coordinates. So it will be the Elasticsearch query that will be querying for that particular polygon for, for and so it will be returning all the restaurants that can be reached to me, uh, like that can deliver to me within let's say next one hour, something like that. So that's a basic idea of isochrones mainly. And uh, yeah, for caching purposes, I think uh, since we cannot cache each and every coordinate, like I mentioned, what I would do is maybe that isochrones, I can create geo hash for each, maybe level seven geo hash I can use because that is just uh, level seven geo hash is uh, kind of like, I think 150 meters, Cross 150 meters, which will cover an entire block. And that block I can cover for that block. It will be, I think, probably 1 billion entries, but I can even optimize it further, like removing water. Uh, we don't want any ocean in there, like any coordinates related to ocean and many other hills and all. So uh, that can be optimized. And uh, with level seven geo hash mapping to the, the different isochrones, we can just get the restaurants pretty easily, pretty fast. So in short, I mean, if we have to summarize this, so yeah, so we have this adding, it has its own uh, challenges in terms of uh, like scaling up the system. I think customers, I didn't care, I didn't add over here, but yes, customers is going to be mainly sharded. Uh, and to scale that way with Cassandra. Then we have another database for Elasticsearch, some cache for optimizations here. Here we'll have some cache and multiple services search, I had viewing service, then some kind of restaurant services. So that's how it is. I think I could clean this diagram up a little bit, but yeah, in short, that's a summary. Awesome, great. Uh, thank you, Niraj, for this. I think this is a very in-depth interview. Um, I loved how from the beginning you gave an overview of different ways we could design Uber Eats, right? Like you didn't focus purely on one user. You were considerate for also the restaurants and the delivery people. Thought that was excellent. And we were able to get like a broad overview on how you would design this, but I loved how also you were able to deep dive into uh, very specific parts of your design if we needed to. I think that's also very valuable to be able to show. Um, so this wraps up our mock interview here. Um, I think this was a, a very excellent example of a typical system design interview that software engineers face and engineering managers face in technical rounds, and perhaps even product managers applying for more technical roles. And hopefully this was helpful for you as an audience. And if you have an upcoming interview, good luck and stay tuned to Exponent for more mock interviews. Thank you. Thanks so much for watching. Don't forget to hit the like and subscribe buttons below to let us know that this video is valuable for you. And of course, check out hundreds more videos just like this at tryexponent.com.
Thanks for watching and good luck on your upcoming interview.